Hi, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. Uh, nice to see uh, all of you and uh, many familiar faces. Uh, some, uh, yeah, that's, that's really good that all of you are here. And my name is Alex. And uh, uh, today we're going to talk about the importance of uh, transactional metadata and the avenues it's opening uh, for Apache Cassandra. Uh, so before we begin, I just wanted to mention that I have several copies of Database and Journals book and I'm going to giving them out for uh, the people who are asking um, good questions. So I have uh, four copies on me and I have uh, several more stashed. Yeah, Mick is, uh, uh, <laughs> or uh, yeah, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're going to be handed out. Anyways, um, let's begin. Um, let me first give you an overview of uh, this talk and uh, um, we're going to start with uh, um, and talk about the motivation about like the motivation why we wanted to make the changes that we've made. Uh, since uh, um, the best way to plan the project is uh, uh, first to have uh, clear requirements about what we want to achieve, let's uh, set also uh, clear requirements. And because I'm presenting to a technical audience, I'm quite certain many of you would be curious about the implementation details. And uh, in fact, uh, many of you are probably here uh, exactly because of that. Okay, that, that was weird. Um, because, uh, yeah, lastly, um, since transactional metadata um, has already landed in Cassandra trunk, we can um, also start talking about the avenues it has opened and uh, the future steps and things that we have started working on. So uh, let's first talk about how we came to the conclusion that we need to make uh, the tr um, cluster metadata transactional. Around 2010, a new wave of uh, NoSQL databases, mostly inspired by DynamoDB paper, have appeared and all of them had several things in common. Uh, having homogenous uh, nodes running on the commodity hardware and implementing cluster metadata through gossip was one of the um, features that they had in common, in fact. With gossip, you can have huge clusters of nodes with spotty connectivity and nodes will be collaborating pro probabilistically, um, propagating state throughout the cluster. In Cassandra, gossip was used for disseminating many things, among which uh, were schema and cluster metadata, which consists of membership and ownership information. Uh, membership information identifies the presence of the node in the cluster, while ownership information identifies the target nodes uh, for reads and writes. Um, there is uh, nothing uh, wrong with disseminating uh, cluster metadata uh, through gossip since uh, that's uh, what it's best for. The things start getting tricky when we expect gossip listeners to have a coherent view of this metadata and act uh, as if this was the case. So uh, gossip has become a, a subsystem that uh, used to react to a membership and ownership changes announced by the nodes. Um, and it was creating, among many other things, something uh, which was called a token metadata object. So anybody who worked with Cassandra for long enough probably knows about its existence. Token metadata is built from the information passed uh, by the subscribers of the gossip state changes. And it is uh, invalidated whenever the ring version changes, which also means that it has to be rebuilt. Unfortunately, this was happening on the hot code path which uh, we ultimately would like to avoid with the transactional cluster metadata project. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the motivation. Uh, most of the Cassandra clusters uh, operated today um, contain only hundreds of nodes, which is a relatively small number compared to the number of participants in something like a mesh network or some internet of things setups where it might be impossible to live without um, gossip or spanning trees or something like that. Uh, we believe it may be more efficient to use uh, simple broadcast as a first line of distribution and natural cluster communication as a backup uh, to disseminate information that is currently being distributed by gossip in older version, which uh, um, will make it uh, simpler to reason about and um, lead to quicker uh, time bound convergence. Um, let's uh, talk through the process uh, of the um, node bootstrap. 
so when the node comes up, uh, it const contacts seed nodes, which can give it the last snapshot of the membership and ownership information um, known to it. But unfortunately, we can not know that there are, um, whether or not there are other nodes that are currently trying to make changes to the ownership of the range we're about to bootstrap. The most straightforward way to work around this problem is to introduce a delay um, so that other um, interested parties could make their intentions known. To reframe this a bit, uh, Shadow Round and uh, um, uh, other delays you see mentioned on the slide uh, here are necessary since we cannot really grab a lock on the cluster uh, instantly or quickly ensure there is no other node that will attempt to modify overlapping ranges uh, co concurrently to us. Another source of complication is that um, the current implementation, um, in current implementation, gossip does not provide a way to ensure the strict ordering of uh, these changes, which uh, may lead to the out of order propagation of the concurrent events. Uh, say if two nodes are bootstrapping simultaneously, coordinator A may observe node one joining before uh, node two joins, and uh, coordinator B may observe uh, them joining in the opposite order. This also means uh, that there can effectively be two disagreeing, disagreeing views of the ring. Of course, uh, in practice, uh, all of this is not super important and can be worked around since operators are usually careful and uh, make sure to only permit safe operations in the cluster. But unfortunately, even if we're willing to ignore these things, there are still things that we cannot easily solve with gossip. I will give an example of a transient data loss um, issue later uh, in my slides. And besides, um, because of the issues with the automation uh, software or human mistakes, there is still some room for error in uh, the current implementation, which we cannot fully eliminate. So one of the things we've been discussing in the Cassandra community lately is a concept of token ownership. Uh, while um, an idea of hashing and a consistent hashing seems to be good on the paper, there are still some things that aren't obvious uh, at the first glance. First one is uh, that it is using randomness in form of consistent hashing and load balancing um, for load balancing and distribution. Um, and this does not guarantee uh, optimal load because unfortunately, even uh, though um, your um, hash is uh, providing uniform well distribution, your data is not uniformly distributed. There are partitions that outweigh the others in terms of size and load, and there are two to the power of 64 tokens if you assume the Murmur 3 partitioner. And the space between uh, these tokens is rather large, which means that there are still uh, many chances for hotspots. Uh, Vnodes, um, as you may know, were an attempt to uh, address uh, the granularity issue, and they did allow um, us to pick the multiple sources for streaming, but this has not uh, completely um, eliminated the problem with load balancing. The ultimate goal of load balancing is to have a way to gradually and dynamically relocate the data. The second problem is that um, token ownership makes it uh, such that uh, nodes position in the ring alongside with the replication factor dictates which ranges uh, it is going to own, right? Because of the ring. Uh, which means that you cannot pick a subset of nodes um, for a specific range and relocate uh, the data to them in order for them to own this data without doing token or arithmetics or relocate a range to a subset of nodes without having them uh, owning the neighboring ranges as well. So I consider this a problem. It is also important for us to uh, have a single point of reference. Any node joining the cluster should be able to quickly um, and easily find the latest membership of the ownership state and modify it without having um, to wait for other nodes to announce their uh, potential actions. If you take a look at how, for instance, Paxos v2 is implemented in um, Cassandra, uh, its payloads contain a list of participants uh, and because the, there is no uh, other easy way to ensure that two nodes have exactly the same view of the ring. And we should make similar information available for every operation, even, even eventually consistent ones. Uh, and we can make um, it very compact. A single number uh, identifying the ring epoch should be sufficient. 
Of course, uh, this applies not just to Paxos, but uh, eventually consistent operations just as well. And coordinators and replicas should agree about the view of the ring, and we should have mechanisms that allow lagging participants to quickly catch up um, for, um, to the latest epoch for the operation that is ongoing. And lastly, we would like the ring consistency uh, for the duration of uh, every operation, which means that a version of the ring available at the end of the oper read or write operation uh, should be compatible with the responses that the coordinator has collected from the replicas. All of these things uh, are required to maintain consistency levels honestly. Uh, we have, uh, um, for instance, if we advertise uh, the replication factor of three, we effectively are making two promises. Uh, by the end of the quorum write, we will have at least two copies of data available, and that the quorum read that follows the quorum write will observe the effects of this write. And uh, let us see in under which conditions uh, these uh, assumptions uh, or promises may not be held. So we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna walk you through the example of the transient loss of the write during the bootstrap. Imagine a cluster with only three nodes with a replication factor of three uh, and nodes A, B, and C present in the ring, and we would like to bootstrap the fourth node, which is X. And um, as you may know, the, in Cassandra, in order to bootstrap a node, you have to add it to the uh, cluster at first as a um, pending node, right? So it's going to be receiving um, the writes, but uh, will not serve any reads. So the reader still, still sees the node X as joining. Meanwhile, from the perspective of the writer, X has fully joined the ring, A is already excluded from the write set, and uh, from its perspective, the um, placements for this uh, write are going to be B, C, and X. And the result is uh, the transient loss of the write during the bootstrap. So effectively, the reader is going to collect the nodes A and B, or may collect nodes A and B, as uh, uh, its replica targets, and it, since it's quorum, it is sufficient for it to complete the operation, and the writer may collect C and X as their uh, write targets, and since these quorums are non-overlapping, we have a transient uh, loss of the write. And uh, one of the problems is that uh, reads and writes are not monotonic with the, the ring involvement, and there is no order guarantees between these two and this may result into this problem ha that has existed in the system for a long while. Um, now, we, let's discuss other uh, problems. So, um, if you are in, in the community long enough, you may have heard about uh, Cassandra 13.004, uh, which was a, a bug that was resulting from um, the schema uh, disagreement in two nodes corrupting the data uh, during the read. So, essentially, read repair was corrupting and the data in the SS table. Uh, however, even if um, uh, the results are not as drastic, there are still problems that are uh, difficult to resolve. So uh, there could be um, racing uh, create table statements and uh, um, like schema disagreements can be manifesting in many different ways. So let's now set up the requirements for what exactly we're trying to achieve. Um, First, we would like to make sure that we remain honest about the consistency levels, uh, even during the range movement. Uh, um, this is a non-negotiable correctness requirement. We would also like to have safe concurrent bootstraps. Multiple nodes should be able to join and leave uh, the cluster, um, and you should have zero knowledge about Cassandra internals to make this happen. Next, we would like nodes to find agreement about the uh, state of the cluster metadata quickly and easily ideally using natural internal uh, traffic. So there should be no additional traffic introduced to the, um, to the cluster. Uh, lastly, we would like the metadata changes to be completely transparent for the user. Clients connected to the cluster should, be, uh, should see absolutely nothing while um, range movements are uh, in progress, not even a single unavailable or a timeout. That would be great. So let's talk a little bit about the implementation details. Um, we have uh, discussed two things already, so um, let's try to sort of incorporate them into the implementation. 
we will maintain compatibility with uh, the uh, tokens uh, during the upgrade period um, and for as long as you continue using old node tool commands. So everything remains 100% backwards compatible. Uh, after migrating to uh, the cluster metadata, nodes, however, will own ranges and not tokens. Uh, good news for Cassandra maintainers is that while doing that, we have also made um, sure to remove the range wraparounds. Um, so all ranges are uh, now from minimum token to the maximum token, so there is technically no ring anymore. Uh, it's just like flatline from the minimum possible token to maximum possible token. Uh, for now, we have decided to maintain full placement compatibility with the old token model, but the plan is to allow dynamic relocation, fully decoupling range ownership from token ownership. So these should be not interrelated in any way. This is technically uh, possible even uh, now, it's just not exposed to the operators just yet. Uh, right now, token metadata changes are uh, just recomputations uh, uh, triggered uh, uh, by the listeners of gossip state changes, meaning that in 5.0 and previous versions. Uh, instead of this, we will now have explicit transformations that live in uh, their own classes and explicitly describe what they're doing. So you will be able to inspect every change executed on the system in lots of detail. If we assume that cluster metadata is an atomic variable and say that we start with some empty state, we can formulate the change events as, a pu as pure functions that take cluster metadata from one state to the next one. No side effects uh, in any one of them whatsoever. Uh, results will be computed on all the nodes in the same way and there will be um, no way for two nodes to have divergent uh, views of metadata if they have uh, seen the same sequence of events, which they will. This also means that every cluster metadata can be uniquely identified by the epoch. Uh, epochs are monotonically incremented and comparable. So any two participants can quickly and easily understand who has a higher epoch and has to catch up. Uh, to preserve uh, the history, uh, all of these transformations are going to be stored in the metadata change log. Uh, long operations such as bootstrap, decommission, move, uh, replace are um, now able to survive the node crashes are, and are now safely resumable. The metadata change log is uh, also going to be strongly consistent. There is only one permitted order of the events and there can be no other history. Uh, the log is stored on a dynamic subset of nodes which are called a cluster metadata service or CMS for short. Uh, this service can be uh, consulted at any point in time to find out the latest state and make the modification to this state. Uh, the participants in the cluster uh, metadata service um, are managed by the cluster metadata service itself without any user intervention, um, reacting to the changes in your cluster size and health of the metadata log owners. So you simply specify the replication factor for uh, the cluster metadata service and the rest is done for you. Newly joined nodes um, only have to know a single node in the cluster in order to discover the latest state of the metadata. So there is no uh, concept uh, of uh, um, CMS nodes or it's gonna be introduced to your scripts or um, setups. Since uh, some operations have uh, um, no visible trace in the um, four metadata, such as bootstrap that was rejected because like the, there was another bootstrap ongoing already, so the ranges were locked, or recreation of an existing table. Uh, the only events that actually make it to the log are ones that actually modify it. So your script, which creates, uh, I don't know, a, a table, if it exists, um, will have no effects on uh, the cluster metadata object because uh, um, it's not going to like grow it exponentially large if it's even running like every sing single second. And, we only preserve the things that actually make um, relevant changes to the metadata. The rest um, are just transparent and do not bump the epoch. And finally, metadata state um, is uh, computed from the log, um, as I have already mentioned. Uh, starting from the empty metadata state, we apply all the events uh, in the order uh, without any gaps. In, and we this way obtain the um, latest version of the metadata state. 
since we plan to allow rather many operations uh, in for that can transform the metadata uh, state in order of tens of uh, thousands per day, um, we decide, uh, decided to use uh, um, data structures that have uh, structural sharing in memory to reduce the memory footprint because uh, if you have several copies of uh, cluster metadata um, objects in memory, we would like it to be as small as possible. And finally, most of the time, uh, new cluster metadata changes will have no influence on the ongoing operations. Um, computation is going to be done completely off-thread and will be made visible only um, when it is complete. So when we manifest the epoch, this is the first time uh, the um, node is going to see it, experience it, and there will be no additional computation required um, for it. All metadata uh, elements, including schema, are now versioned. Um, changes uh, to one key space or table do not bump the epoch for other tables and key spaces, and placement information is also versioned. Uh, epochs are changed only for the ranges that are actually affected by the operations. So if uh, uh, you have bootstrapped the node, it doesn't mean that entire state has to be recomputed and uh, the state or the epoch for each and every range has to be bumped. So only the touched ranges are actually going to get their epochs bumped. Read and write requests uh, now include relevant uh, coordinator schema epoch and um, epoch when the range for which uh, the current request is being performed was last modified. This means that nodes can quickly and uh, efficiently check that their epochs match and can, uh, the lagging node can uh, catch up to the relevant epoch. Mm. And best of all, uh, none of this requires communication with the cluster metadata service. Uh, nodes can simply exchange the relevant uh, uh, metadata mutation among themselves without involving uh, CMS nodes. So there will be no um, extra load on these nodes either. Um, let's talk about uh, maintaining the consistency levels and how we have achieved uh, uh, whatever I have mentioned before with uh, the uh, loss of uh, the transient rights. And uh, um, I will simply walk you through the same things in more uh, visual form. Uh, so let's uh, talk through how uh, the node uh, X is going to be bootstrapped with uh, the transactional cluster metadata. We now again have uh, uh, the same setup. We have a three node cluster, replication factor of three, and the node X is being bootstrapped into this cluster. And uh, uh, here, the first uh, and foremost uh, uh, step, we have uh, something that we call prepare join. And uh, during this, uh, the ranges that are owned by the neighboring uh, replicas are split and there are no other changes uh, being made to the uh, state of the cluster. So basically we introduce uh, uh, the new token where the X is going to reside, but apart from that, we do not make any changes to the ring. Uh, the next one, uh, we add X uh, to the uh, right set. So this is very similar to the introduction of the pending uh, node in uh, the previous model. And uh, yeah, we essentially say that, okay, now the right set is uh, for the given ranges is expanded by addition of uh, the node X. So if in the previous uh, uh, case, the uh, range from zero to 100 um, had a right set of A and B, now it's also going to include X. For the next step, we uh, had to introduce a concept of a progress barrier. Uh, it is serving as a way to ensure we maintain the promises about the consistency level, as we discussed before. Uh, we can summarize uh, the need for it in uh, uh, three conjectures. Um, first one is the bootstrapping node has to receive uh, every single mutation, so every single write that has been made. In other words, um, Streaming must wait for the event that adds the target node as a write replica to be acknowledged by the majority of replicas owning the range before uh, we can start streaming. Uh, second one is the streaming should start only after a writing starts to the pending node. So before that, so streaming has to be blocked and it has to wait until it knows that the majority of nodes has experienced this epoch, manifested it. And the third one, all possible read and write majorities uh, of replicas, uh, replica sets uh, for both reads and writes, as I said, um, 
have uh, to overlap um, like th their majorities, right? And uh, this is done by essentially computing the majorities for each and every step in a way that um, is done. We have uh, a special simulator for that and you can um, check the Cassandra code for more details. Every uh, subsequent event must wait for the previous event to be acknowledged by the majority of replicas um, owning the range before um, it can be submitted. So the progress barrier is essentially preventing the um, next operation to be executed before the previous one has been acknowledged and manifested by the majority of the existing replica set. The next step is uh, um, something we called mid-join. And in this step, we simply replace uh, the node um, that is losing the range uh, with the node that is gaining the range uh, in the read replica set without any touches to the write replica set. And the last step, we manifest fully the X as a complete and rightful owner of uh, um, the token it has bootstrapped for. And in this case, uh, you see that we have moved from basically um, introducing the nodes through all the steps, and now it uh, serves as both read and write replica for uh, the ranges it is going to um, own. So uh, to summarize uh, the bootstrap process, uh, now we are bootstrapping uh, using uh, the ranges and not tokens. And uh, um, in order to bootstrap, the node first to, has to contact one of the ranges, uh, one of the nodes in the cluster, and this node is going to notify it who is the CMS. The CMS is uh, given the latest information about all the epochs. The node is catching up um, to the uh, latest epoch. Then it plans, splits ranges, starts streaming, and moves through all the necessary steps in order to um, get bootstrapped. Between all, every uh, operation, we have a progress barrier that prevents uh, uh, the progress until the majority of the nodes have experienced uh, the epoch that uh, precedes the next one. And uh, finally, we unlock the ranges and the node uh, is uh, uh, fully bootstrapped. Of course, uh, you may be concerned about uh, what is happening if uh, you're losing the majority of uh, the um, cluster metadata service nodes. Uh, it's not a problem. We have a series of scripts that allow you to quickly and easily recover from that. So essentially, you can introduce new nodes by forcing a so to say, two-phase commit over the existing nodes. Uh, we expect this to never be used by anybody. We wrote it in order to, uh, in a way, placate everybody that don't worry, if something really, really bad happens, you can still have a way out. But uh, we cannot really conceive um, a scenario where something like that can be uh, necessary. Um, so. And of course, we've done uh, a lot of testing in order to make sure that this feature is um, as rock solid as uh, uh, possible. Um, as you may know, Cassandra has a state-of-the-art simulator, and uh, we've done hundreds of hours of uh, simulation um, on the Cassandra simulator using uh, the fast testing tool that we wrote, uh, which is called Harry. Um, we also wrote special simulator for quorum intersections. Uh, in order to analyze and uh, sort of like conclusively prove that there can be no way for us to collect non-intersecting majorities for the steps that are being executed. So as long as we comply to the protocol that is given by the progress barrier, then can be no transient data loss. And uh, um, uh, we have uh, uh, created a new sets of tests which we call coordinator or replica tests. Uh, in this case, uh, um, you are uh, writing tests from the perspective of a single node. It is either a coordinator or a replica, and the rest of the state of the cluster is completely simulated. So you can simulate arbitrarily large or small clusters um, by essentially uh, talking or, and writing the behavior of a single node. So this is very useful for um, testing the scenarios of like this transient data loss and a recovery from it. Um, yeah, so we have uh, written a bunch of tests uh, for um, the TCM as well, and uh, you can, of course, uh, take a look at all of them in the Cassandra tree. And uh, um, 
If you leave this presentation with uh, just one word uh, in your mind that is associated with the uh, transactional cluster metadata, I would like uh, you to keep the word elasticity in mind, right? Uh, and uh, um, I think that Cassandra has to become more elastic, right? Like more dynamic. And uh, um, the things that transactional cluster metadata is uh, making not only possible, but many of these things are actually becoming trivial are the following. I don't wanna read them from you. I'm personally most uh, uh, excited about uh, the byte ordered partitioner. And I have heard that, for instance, uh, Branimir is also very excited, the person who presented right before me. Uh, yeah, because uh, it very nicely plays uh, together with uh, the uh, tri-based um, uh, man tables and SS tables. And uh, uh, it is going to serve as a um, better metadata for LWTs that are existing and for Accord, uh, you will be able to improve your control planes uh, and many of the operations that have been previously painful and uh, had to be um, watched by a team of trained uh, Cassandra professionals uh, now hopefully can be executed uh, uh, completely painlessly. Um, so in order to recap uh, and sort of summarize everything that we talked about today, so we, we talked about the motivation, uh, like why we wanted to uh, introduce the concept of transactional cluster metadata, and we discussed why we would like to um, stop using gossip for this subset of things. Of course, we still are going to be using gossip for things like uh, load, uh, failure detection, and some other transient information about the nodes, but it is not going to be used for um, cluster metadata anymore and cluster metadata is going to be now transactional. We've discussed uh, the requirements, what exactly we would like to achieve, and uh, uh, we set the goal for ourselves before we set out with the uh, project. You can also read the document, uh, the CEP, uh, on the um, uh, Cassandra Confluence or Apache Confluence, um, and uh, we presented it to the community, and uh, many folks have agreed that this is the way uh, to go, and we would like to pursue um, that. Then we talked about the implementation, some of the details of the previous implementation, some of the details of the new one. So basically moving from the uh, token model to range model, making uh, the metadata changes uh, uh, strictly ordered and uh, um, consistent. And we've talked about the future and the avenues that uh, transactional cluster metadata is opening for us. And uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming to the presentation. I appreciate uh, your attention and uh, uh, of course uh, the books still await uh, the persons who would like uh, uh <laughs> uh, to ask a question. Um, so go ahead and shoot. Yes, please. Yes, uh, so... Um, in addition to the uh, two simulations that I have mentioned, we have a third simulation that I failed to mention, uh, which is uh, uh, metadata change simulator. Um, the metadata ch change simulator um, cha uh, picks one of the possible operations uh, given the setup of the cluster. So it first pre-generates an arbitrarily uh, large cluster and then um, just looks at the state of the cluster and thinks, okay, can I bootstrap the node in the cluster? Can I make one of the node leave, nodes leave? Can I make, um, like move one of the tokens in the ring and so forth? Then it makes a decision that, okay, I would like to perform this operation. And um, it can also, on the next step, instead of um, continuing with the bootstrap, it can choose to, well, bootstrap one more node or have uh, one node bootstrapping, one node leaving or uh, one node uh, leaving and the other one moving the token. So we definitely have simulated uh, the concurrent operations. Um, this has been a huge area of uh, our focus in the very beginning because we thought that if we cannot achieve that, then what are we doing at all? So th we definitely did a lot of that and um, yeah. Yeah, so um, I, 
will repeat this one because I think I haven't uh, repeated the previous one. How we do we expect uh, the cold, uh, uh, this to affect the cold restarts? Uh, so um, I'm assuming that uh, cold restarts is like uh, rolling bounces whenever you need to restart every single node in the cluster. Is this? Uh, Um, so, uh, w once again, uh, um, y would you like to um, bring up a whole new data center with hundreds of nodes um, and none of them have been a member of the cluster before that? Is this w what you would like to achieve ultimately? Okay, so in this case, um, we have uh, two scenarios. One scenario is uh, um, first, you bring up some of the nodes that are going to be the cluster metadata service. You can bring up one node that is going to be CMS. That's uh, the quickest uh, and simplest scenario and easiest to achieve. I would pr personally probably do that. Uh, then you just start all the other nodes and they start registering and uh, registering uh, is uh, as easy as simply submitting a single uh, LWT or Paxos operation it is uh, very quick. It's uh, currently two round trips because we are using Paxos v2. Um, and uh, um, I expect uh, maybe there will be some contention, but even for a thousand node cluster, like we, we actually simulated way more contended uh, um, um, scenarios with Paxos v2. We have not um, simulated anything like that specifically with the TCM uh, in this case, but I don't expect any problems to uh, be happening. And in the scenario when you don't have any data in the cluster, instead of uh, using the multi-step operations that I have presented previously, you can save something that we, uh, you can use something that we call uh, unsafe join, which is a single operation, which means that uh, everybody just joins and in, uh, in one step. So they register, they join, and ev after that you have uh, um, a thousand node cluster and I expect it to be, um, I mean, essentially all of the time taking is gonna be startup time. You will not even notice uh, uh, anything on top of that. So that's, that's my uh, take on that. Anybody else? Uh, Josh, uh, sorry. Uh, okay. <laughs> So that, that's the difference between um, the concept of a pending range, which means that uh, you're, um, you have to write to the majority of uh, um, the previously existing nodes plus one. Uh, we have changed it and uh, um, we essentially expand the replica set by one and the majority is gonna be um, number of nodes divided by two plus one, which means that for three, nodes and one bootstrapping, we have four nodes. So the majority is of course three nodes, but it can be three existing nodes. It so you're not good with your old quorum. You will have, you have expanded your quorum and you will have to write a, a to all of them effectively. Yeah, in this case, you have absolutely no problem. Um, um, you will, as, as you expanded the quorum, you will have to write to uh, three nodes instead of just two. Uh, you can quickly revert the operation, meaning that uh, you can sort of like abort the um, uh, bootstrap uh, and it's a very easy and quick operation. Um, but uh, yeah, so that, that's the, the answer. Um, yes, please, uh, in, in the white t-shirt. Okay, the question is, what is the upgrade path from the existing uh, uh, gossip clusters to TCM clusters? Um, the process is as follows. Um, you um, bring up all the nodes with the version that is aware about the existence of transactional cluster metadata, um, and you start the upgrade process by uh, running a simple node tool command. Um, uh, I don't remember, it's initialized CMS or something like that. Um, there is a documentation on the Cassandra website, uh, of course, for that, uh, or like in tree even. Uh, and uh, uh, this command does the following. It ensures that 
every single participant in the cluster has the same gossip view of the ring, meaning that uh, they have converged in terms of gossip because otherwise what state can we base our transactional cluster metadata upon? So that's prerequisite. If you have some nodes that um, have corrupted view of the gossip, you can actually ignore them. You can manually inspect, uh, like in fact, during the upgrade, we uh, print the diff uh, for you and we say that, okay, uh, here is the disagreeing nodes and here is where they disagree. And you can still say that, you know what, um, I think that these nodes are wrong. I don't know why and I don't have time to figure it out. So let's just uh, say that I, like this uh, um, gossip state that uh, like main one sort of looks fine for me. So let's go ahead with this one. And after that, we uh, are using a two-phase commit, um, which requires all the participants to respond uh, during the first phase and say, yes, I promise you that I will uh, upgrade to a single um, state, a single instance of a transactional cluster metadata, because if you accidentally launch two upgrades, then, well, we would like to prevent that. Um, and we would like nobody to think about like how to avoid something like that. So we have to, uh, consult not the majority of nodes, but actually every single participants. This is uh, the point of uh, to face commit. Uh, and after they all of them have promised, uh, they uh, you go through the second step and you essentially instantiate the uh, first instance of transactional cluster metadata. And after that, uh, everything goes on as uh, previously, uh, just not with gossip, but with TCM. There is a single limitation uh, that uh, um, during the uh, the upgrade process, um, you cannot, like the uh, metadata is essentially locked. So you cannot bootstrap or decommission the nodes. But um, the word on the street is uh, that, uh, like if you are upgrading, you better not have also um, like bootstraps uh, while doing that because there can be uh, several things in flight uh, that, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's just uh, many people don't do that. Uh, so yeah, that, that's the only limitation. Um, there is a way to downgrade as well. So you essentially say, okay, convert the transactional cluster metadata back to the gossip state. Uh, the gossip state is propagated and you downgrade, but uh, I don't really anticipate anybody needing this uh, barring uh, the issues uh, with uh, something else in Cassandra. Yes, uh, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, I, I understand what you're saying. I just don't hear the question. Could you uh, phrase it in, in, in a form that, that could be like, uh, w what are you asking? Like, uh, are you trying to achieve something or you think that uh, the way we've implemented it uh, uh, has, has some... In Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Okay, now now I see. Uh, of course, uh, um, the uh, transactional cluster metadata can be used in order to dynamically move individual partitions between nodes. This is absolutely true. Uh, the only reason we have not done that is uh, to um, for everybody in the community to be able to keep using their current tooling, uh, Cassandra tooling, because. I'm assuming that uh, you have actually like concept of tokens in all of your scripts, right? Uh, there is absolutely nothing that prevent that is preventing you from um, saying that certain ranges are owned uh, by like a single node or even a single token is uh, um, owned by a subset of nodes. You can even say that uh, the replica set for a given, I don't know, token is not three, but five or seven, uh, e like anything goes really. So um, from the perspective of transactional cluster metadata, everything is just uh, like a range and a set of nodes that owns the range. So this is already implemented. The reason we have not exposed it is that we wanted to everybody to have uh, an opportunity to transition first to the, um, well, the system where this is, uh, like everything is transactional. And after that, we will start introducing new, t new tooling that will allow uh, dynamic um, repartitioning 
um, different uh, ways of you know uh, load balance uh, reintroduce the binary ordered partitioner which would mean also that you would will, will be able to essentially have shards and Cassandra and so forth so this is in the books uh, everything for that is essentially implemented as a prerequisite but like the features itself uh, are still to be done but this is planned 